I used to have a shirt that said, if all else fails, read the instructions. And it had a picture of the Bible. And, um, you know, I find that to be true. It's a really great thing to have an instruction manual, especially in this world that can get so crazy. This is Nonfiction November, and one of the prompts is collections. And so I would love to share with you from my collection of Bible studies. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Um, I'm Miss Thomas. This is Book Talks with Miss Thomas. And today I would like to share with you from my collection of Bible studies. Now I have been actively reading the Bible. I try to read every day for the last 20 years and I'm far from perfect. Sometimes I have my seasons where I drift and wander. Um, and so I may not consistently read, but over the 20 plus years of my life, I have been pretty, um, pretty actively reading the Bible and trying to live according to the Bible. So I would like to share with you some of the uh, things from my collection. Now I want to start with the book of Esther. I did a study on the book of Esther and the study was written by Beth Moore. And this is the study that I did. And I did it actually twice in two different churches, which is interesting because I switched churches. And when I went to a new church, those women were doing Esther too. Um, so it's interesting because a few years had passed in between the two times that I studied Esther and I was at completely different points in my life. And the study spoke to me very differently at the different points in my life. So when I studied Esther in one situation, it helped me with one part of uh, my life, one season of my life. And then when I was somewhere else in my walk with the Lord, I did Esther yet again, and it spoke to me about that season of my life. So I think that um, when people say the living word, the word is alive, I think what that means, at least what it means for me, is that the Holy Spirit can use his word and he can use the writers of studies to speak to you about whatever it is you need at that point in your life. So Esther is um, the story of a girl who was orphaned and raised by her cousin or her uncle. I'm sorry. I think it was her uncle, Mordecai. And I have to say up front, let me just have a little mini rant that when people say, oh, the Bible's not written for women and people who are Christians are sexist and, you know, the Bible writers aren't very nice to women and women don't have rights in the Bible. I have to say, I absolutely disagree with that. There is so much in the Bible where God affirms women. So um, let me speak to that. I'm going to speak to that a few times in this video because there are other books where God affirms women as well. But in the book of Esther, um, you know, Esther was raised by her uncle Mordecai, and I affirmed in my clip, uh, my short that I had that points to this video. I always have a short that gives you like a um, looking ahead kind of thing so you know what to expect in my video. So if you haven't seen that, go back. But in that short, I talk about Esther, and I suggest in there that Esther was probably taught to read and write by Mordecai. And you know, the reason I say that is because in the book of Esther, Esther writes letters back and forth to Mordecai. So um, I don't know that women were automatically taught to read and write during that time period. I doubt it. And the fact that she was literate says a lot. And we know that she was literate because she was writing letters that are in the Bible um, to Mordecai. So I don't want to go through the whole story of Esther, but I will tell you, you know, she was an orphan. She was raised um, by the guard, the palace guard, Mordecai. She was Jewish. Mordecai was Jewish. And there was this awful guy named Haman, who was like the king's um, second in command, that uh, really resented Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. Mordecai would only bow to his God. And so because of that, um, Haman had a couple schemes, but the main was to just 
try and get um, all of the Jewish people exiled, and he succeeded. He, he got the king to agree to having all of the Jewish people exiled. The problem with that is that Esther is Jewish. Now, that's a secret. She didn't tell the king she was Jewish. Um, she was forced into this beauty pageant because he was looking for a wife, and she was beautiful and gracious and smart. And he chose her and um, married her and made her queen, by the way, he just threw away the previous queen. He, he got mad at her because she wouldn't parade around at this big drunken party wearing her crown. Some scholars say, was it because she, he wanted her to wear nothing but her crown? Um, I don't know. I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to tell you that Esther was forced into this beauty pageant where she had to marry this guy who pretty much tossed his you know, last queen out on the road uh, because she said no to him. So that puts Esther in a precarious position. She's, you know, married to this man that she didn't choose for a husband, even though she is queen, and that probably came with some perks. She um, finds out through Mordecai that she needs to tell the king, you have to undo this order to have all of these Jewish people exiled because that would include my family and me. And she doesn't have the courage to do that because Mordecai, I'm, I'm sorry, um, the king, Xerxes, is intimidating. I mean, look what he did to the last queen. And so she really struggles with finding her courage. And there are some things in the Bible to suggest that she was pretty strategic in the way that she went about finally confronting um, the king with this. And there's also, um, it's noteworthy that she calls for some fasting. So she definitely relied on God in the book of Esther. We see Esther's faith. So those are some really noteworthy things about Esther. Um, okay, while we are on the subject of God and his treatment of women in the Bible, I want to move to my next study, which was Hearts of Iron, Feet of Clay by Dr. Gary Inrig. And this is on the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges has a lot of scandal. There's a lot of violence. There's um, some sex. Um, there's some things in the book of Judges that are really... Um, quite shocking. So uh, again, if there's this 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 uh, preconceived idea out there that Christians are boring or Christians, you know, live under a rock, not so. Um, we, you know, at least I and the women in my church have read the Book of Judges, and we are aware of a lot of the um, scandalous things that have happened, especially um, in the Bible. So um, no one is above temptation, I guess. And in the book of Judges, we definitely see, according to Dr. Inrig, we see this uh, spiraling toward evil, and then God rescues the people and brings them back up, and then they spiral again and fall into the pit, and God brings them back up. And to me, what that says is that we serve a very, very merciful God, a very patient God, a very loving God, and that no sin can surprise God, that God can and will forgive any sin if you sincerely trust in him and repent. Repent, by the way, means change. It's not just, oh, I'm sorry, and, you know, sorry, not sorry, going back and doing it again. It means you truly want to change and um, do better. So as far as women go, uh, one of the judges in God's book of Judges is Deborah, who is a tremendous military rock star. Deborah um, leads the uh, people to battle and to victory because of her faith in God. So again, we see God um, raising up women in the Bible. So please don't tell me that God, you know, is sexist. <laughs> He's not. It really bothers me when people say that. And um, I also want to tell you Gideon in the book of Judges was particularly amusing to me. I'm going to have to put my glasses on. But there's this thing with Gideon where um, God says, you know, Gideon was raised by a father who had uh, a pagan symbol in the backyard, like a pagan altar in the backyard. And God tells Gideon to destroy the altar and build up... Um, a fire to glorify God. And Gideon reluctantly does this. He wants to follow God, but sort of not 
entirely, right? Because he's afraid and we can understand that. We can understand fear. And because Gideon's afraid to openly come 100% out with his worship of God, he lights his fire at night. <laughs> and a friend of mine in the Bible study pointed out how hilarious that is. Because if you think about it, if you're going to light a fire and you don't want too many people to see it, would you do that in the day or at night? So it's just a little humor. I think God has a great sense of humor. And I think things in, in um, the Bible that are funny are peppered in. I think God is trying to pepper in a little bit of humor for us sometimes. And that's one thing I wanted to say is about Gideon lighting the fire. Because that was one of my happier memories. I meet with women on Wednesday nights and we discuss these Bible studies. Um, another thing about Gideon I want to talk about is, you know, Gideon led his people to victory and then he took some things personally and he did some rash things and he acted on his own without relying on God. And a lot of times his ego got in the way. And, you know, we can sit there and bash Gideon, but he did lead the people to victory and he did a lot of good things. The lesson we need to learn is that it's it's sometimes it's always good to rely entirely on God. And I can't put it as well as Dr. Inrig. So I will say I have it highlighted in my book. He says the purpose of God's deliverance was to make sure Israel knew that he was the source, not they. But Gideon was making it about himself. And so that caused some problems for Gideon. And I did say, I think it was in my uh, nonfiction November reading plan that I part with books, but I don't part with my Bible studies. And that's because you can see I write all over them and I highlight and I put deeply personal things in here. And I want to share with you something deeply personal that I wrote in this one because I think it can benefit other people. So after reading about Gideon, what I wrote in the margin just to myself for my own memory and reference is, I see myself here. This year especially, I see the need to set aside personal pride, hurt, and um, anger in order to be successful at, at the bigger picture. I'm pleasantly surprised how easy it can be to simply decide to let go of anger, hurt, and pride. Just choose to let it go and focus on the job God gave me. It's powerful. And I wrote that to myself years ago, and I think that um, I'm still trying to live by that. Of course, everyone gets angry. I get angry too, but I try to stop and think, you know, what's the bigger picture here? Is this about me and my feelings being hurt or whatever it is that's offended me? Or is this about a bigger thing? You know, am I going to, as my mom would say, cut off my nose to spite my face by getting into an argument about this? You know, there are times where you have to speak up. You have to say sometimes to people respectfully and with love and with dignity, hey, I really, you know, disagree with this. We need to talk about this. But never in anger, never in a way that is going to be destructive and hurt others. So that was a big takeaway for me um, from the book of Judges and this study. There are, of course, some other things in the book of Judges that I'm not going to get into um, just because of time constraints. But, you know, we meet Samson and Delilah in the book of Judges. And there's, you know, some other stories. Like there's the one about the king and someone sneaks in and stabs him and the knife goes through his belly. And, um... The people that serve him, his servants, they think he's just in the bathroom for a really long time. So, you know, there's some there's some odd little scandalous tidbits in the book of Judges. But um, I definitely enjoyed this study and I learned a lot about myself in this study. And I think, you know, that's the purpose. We're supposed to use God's word to let him tell us what it is that he wants us to know so that we can be closer to him. Now, another one that I really enjoyed was The Word of the Lord by Nancy Guthrie. And this one was um, every, every week we studied a different prophet in the Old Testament. And I think that's fascinating, by the way. I, um, I really find a lot of fascination in how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. And sometimes for me, there's a disconnect. And I'm always looking to see, um, you know, how does this relate to this? Actually, in everything I read, I'm always trying to make connections. You're supposed to make connections when you read. But for me, this one connects the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the purpose of this study 
um, it says, seeing Jesus in the prophets is the byline. So um, there was a study each week on each of the Old Testament prophets, and that was kind of cool just to learn about some of the really um, lesser known prophets in the Old Testament. That in itself was a, a treasure. But um, what the purpose was, was to talk about how that prophet relates to the New Testament. And um, the first one was Jonah. And I have to say, I struggle with Jonah. I, I, I have a hard time um, sympathizing with Jonah. And I've had this conversation with other people in my church um, because he was just so unmerciless, un unmerciful, unmerciful in the way he wanted, you know, wrath to pour out on Nineveh. And I just have such a hard time. How can you see that level of repentance and that level of remorse for sin and still want to punish? Um, and God, of course, doesn't punish them. He brings them grace and mercy. And um, I don't know, but then a friend of mine said, yeah, but Jonah knew that that wasn't, he knew what they were going to do after that. And so that's why he felt the way he did. Okay. So um, anyway, the point of the study was to connect the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament. So for example, um, Jonah, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and Jesus is the word of the Lord. And Jonah was sent to deliver a message and Jesus was sent to deliver a message um, when Jonah was called to Nineveh, Jonah turned and went in the other direction. Um, Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed and he did, you know, grieve in the garden of Gethsemane, but he continued to move forward for our sakes. Um, because he had been disobedient to God, Jonah offered himself to die in the sea so that everyone on the ship would live. Of course, Jesus died on the cross so that we may live. Um, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days. Jesus was on the cross for three days. So, um, you know, and there's so much more. So I wanted to share that with you. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that one, you know, a lot of people are especially interested in Daniel. People connect Daniel to Revelation because Daniel has a lot to do with prophesying the end times. Um, so definitely Daniel, I've done a couple studies on Daniel. That's been fascinating. But to talk about Daniel's connection to the New Testament, um, though Daniel was living in the king, kingdom of Babylon, he was from the kingdom of um, Judah. And if you look at Jesus, and specifically in John uh, 6, verse 33, and John 18, verse 36, you see that Jesus came from a different kingdom too. And he says, you know, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. So we see Daniel in a different place, like this is not his home. We see Jesus in a different place, this is not his home. And I say that to my own biological children all the time. I always, when they're frustrated by things, horrible things in the world, I say, this is not your home, okay? This is very temporary. You are an ambassador here, but you're one day gonna be up in heaven in a, in a completely different kingdom that's gonna be fantastic. I absolutely believe that. Um, and then back to Daniel, though, um, Darius, that was the king at the time, he wanted to release Daniel instead of sending him to the lion's den. And we see Pilate trying to wash his hands of his decision to um, crucify Jesus. So Pilate and, and Darius. Um, Jesus, Daniel is not recorded as having said anything in his defense ever. And then Jesus made no reply when Pilate... Um, was, you know, questioning him. And um, Daniel was placed in a den or a cave, which was sealed with a stone so that he could not be saved by human intervention. And we see the stone um, covering the grave of Jesus, which was, you know, removed. And Daniel willingly faced the threat of death. Jesus did too. But, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that that was still a painful, upsetting thing. And um, when the stone was removed, Daniel came out of the den, metaphorically brought back from the dead. Jesus was brought back from the dead. Um, so there's a lot in here about how Daniel points to the New Testament. And there were just several others. Um, I think it was the book of Micah that I wanna talk about also. And finally, very briefly, I want to talk about the prophet Micah. Um, he's not as widely known, Micah, 
But in Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 4, he says... In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the chief among the mountains, it will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. So when you think like, how do you stream to a mountain? You would stream away from a mountain, wouldn't you? So I think personally, and I got this impression from Nancy Guthrie in her study, that it's a reference to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus went to the top of the mountain and people streamed to the mountain to hear the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and the book of Micah goes on to say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the Lord, God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. I believe that is a reference to the Sermon on the Mount, which by the way, is another study that I did, <laughs> but I won't go on and on about that. Last, I'm gonna very briefly talk about Angram Lots only because, well, it was a fantastic study, but the thing about this study is it really got me thinking about the promises of God, and it, it has me now visiting various promises of God in the Bible. That's sort of my current focus, and that is a reaction, a response to this study. Um, Anne Graham Lott's The Magnificent Obsession, Embracing the God-Filled Life, and this, this particular study focuses on Abraham, and of course, Abraham was promised to be the father of the nations. And so as I was doing this study, I really started to think about, hmm, really, God has promises? Well, what are his promises for me then? Because if I could live according to God's promises, then you know maybe that could encourage me in my faith, and it has, it really has. And so I bought this book, um, Bible Promises for Life for Women. And it's just one of many. I just Googled um, promises, you know, God's promises. And that was the book I landed on. And every so often I bring up a verse and I think about that verse and pray on that verse. And so um, let, me, let me give you an example real quick. So I always ask God first. When, when I read the Bible, I always pray first. And I say, God, you know, here I am. I want to learn from you. Tell me what it is you want to say to me today. Tell me what it is you want me to focus on. I'm going to read a verse here and um, I want you to, to speak to me and I will try to listen. And I just randomly opened to this page on forgiveness. And this is a really tough one. It says, God passed in front of him and called out, God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sin. He holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sin to a third and even fourth generation. And that's Exodus 34, verse six through seven. Now, this is from the message. Um, that's one thing about this particular book. Um, it, it has various translations and some people could argue one translation over another translation. Um, most people like would argue that the King James is the truest translation. Um, I would agree. However, I when I was first learning about the Bible and Bible study, King James would be too discouraging for me, at least, having reading problems. And so I did the NIV, which is, um, you know, a little more loosely translated than the King James. And then this one is the message, which is much more loosely translated. But I still see value in that. If there's, you know, if you want to learn about the Bible and you're new to the Bible, maybe getting something like the message gives you the gist. Um, and then as you grow and you want to learn more, you can start to look at um, other translations. And I did a study on the Sermon on the Mount. I can't remember the name of the um, the author of that one, but I did, I, I mentioned it in my get, don't get ready with me video because I didn't have makeup or hair, you know, so I just called it my don't get ready with me. Um, I can link that for you. But um, that was a neat study because we talked about different verses. We would compare the verse in various translations. So you might see it in the NIV and then side by side, put it next to the King James and um, look at the differences and, you know, how are the Versus like, does one add to your understanding or take away from your understanding? And that's really cool. 
But as for this verse, this is a good one I want to close with because when I read this and I prayed and I said, wow, God, this is a really hard verse to understand. Can you, can you give me some insight here? Because, you know, I don't think, I think that if I didn't pray and I didn't ask God for wisdom, I might just look at this and go, he holds sons and grandsons responsible for father's sins to the third and fourth generation. And that's a scary thought, you know, and I'm really not equipped to discuss exactly what that means. I've asked my pastor, um, he's going to get back to me about that. But I will say, when I prayed, what I felt in my heart was that God was saying, hey, look at the difference between mercy and love for thousands of generations, as opposed to um, transgressions and rebellion for the father and the grandfather's transgressions. And to me, praying before reading that verse really helped me to say that, you know, okay, I don't completely understand, but I definitely get from you today that you're telling me, God, you're merciful and you're loving and that you will bless me if I walk with you and make the right choices um, according to what I believe you want for me and for my life. Um, the only other thing, I mean, that's a hard one. I think when, when a parent, um, makes bad choices, it can affect the life of the child. I think maybe that is referenced or reflected in that verse a little bit too. Um, you know, for example, um, my father was an alcoholic, and so um, I grew up around a lot of alcoholism. And, you know, certainly as a result of that, I made some bad choices and um, took me a while to recognize that that wasn't the um, plan for me for my life. And so I actually think in terms of like, my dad had some good qualities, but he had some bad qualities. And I think, okay, well, God in heaven is perfect. And so ultimately, I have a perfect father. And I can look at the mistakes and the bad things from my childhood. And I can say, okay, but my father in heaven loves me. And um, to me, that's about it. <laughs> that's all there is to it. Being loved um, really makes a difference. So anyway, that is my collection um, for nonfiction November. And if you are interested in Bible studies, I can certainly talk about other ones, but I just wanted to, for the purpose of nonfiction November, just some top picks from my collection. So I hope that some of those things spoke to you and maybe you will seek out um, God's word for yourself. Thanks for listening.